foundational teachings in Scripture and the Christian faith has to do with the power of one person. In the New Testament, we read that just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, that the second Adam pays for that sin. The power of one person. The power of one person giving their life. And so Jesus will say in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command. If there is one doctrine that has been forgotten, neglected, overlooked, it is this doctrine that Christ, his death, his resurrection, was a payment by one man who was innocent, who gave his life for you and for me, for the sin of the world. When we lose sight of that, then Christianity becomes something else. But also, when we lose sight of that, uh, liberty, political liberty, freedom, the cost of those who have gone before us, who have given their lives, it's estimated approximately in this generation, just 1% of people will go into the military. So it's virtually an unknown world to this generation. It was upwards of 50% in World War II that would eventually find themselves uh, wearing the uniform of the United States. Does that make a difference? Does it make a difference if that was your son, if that was your daughter, your husband? There's one day that is considered to have set the future generations of which you and I are part. That day was June 6th, 1944. We celebrated this week uh, the Battle of Normandy. On the night before that force came to the shores of France, General Eisenhower gathered some troops and he said, your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped, battle hardened. He will fight savagely. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Let us all beseech the blessings of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. The next day, June 5th, 1944, in preparation, troops from around the country they gathered. They gathered in chapels, in fields. They gathered in churches to pray, many of them to take their last communion. On the night before the descent on Normandy, 
some 23,000 paratroopers, screaming eagles, of which my uncle was a member. The average age of those young men was 24. 24 in the prime of their life. And they began to drop from planes. In all, some 5,000 planes would drop their precious cargo. Many of those screaming eagles never landed on the ground. Some were shot in the air as they descended. Others were caught in trees. Some drowned in flooded rivers and marshes and in the sea. On that day, 2,500 screaming eagles would not see the end of the day. While they were descending from above, some 156,000 soldiers were jammed in 10,000 Higgins boats. Higgins boats designed by a man from Nebraska who anticipated the coming events and designed a craft that would have a shallow hull that could pull almost to the beach and the front gate would drop. Today, the only awareness we have of Higgins boats are duck tours in virtually every big city. And you can see the duck boat going through the streets of Philadelphia, of San Francisco. What are those boats? Those are Higgins boats the same ones that dropped these soldiers. They were crammed into those boats. Some 73,000 were from the United States. Another 83,000 were from Britain and Canada. There was only one father and son who were on the beach at Normandy that day. It was the son of Theodore Roosevelt. He was 56 years old. He was infirm. He landed on the beach with his cane. He fought vigorously with his son, Quentin. At the end of the war, Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., 56 years old, would be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for valor in those hours at Normandy. And so they landed knee-deep in salt water, carrying 80 Pound packs. Their guns alone weighed 32 pounds. They hit the beach. Others never reached the beach. The waters would run red that day. The beaches were booby trapped. And yet, they kept coming, more and more. There were five different beaches in the Normandy invasion. Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juneau, 
sword. They landed on the beach. They crossed the sea walls, the barricades. It said that the chances of surviving that battle were one in four. And then there were the cliffs. The cliffs of Normandy. The cliffs upon which German soldiers awaited eagerly. There were some 225 rangers who landed that morning off the coast. They had a task to take the cliffs. It would be considered the toughest and most difficult assignments ever given to any unit in the military. They land on the tiny beach. Their mission? To scale 10 story high cliffs of Pointe de Ho. Under a continual barrage from above of gunfire, hand grenades. Their mission was to take that gun battery. It was a purely volunteer group. 2,000 volunteered for that assignment. 700 went through training. 225 were selected. Who were they? They were sons and daughters. They were cowboys, oyster men, bullfighters, burlesque operators, church deacons, oil speculators, railroad workers, coal miners, tomato farmers, barbers, insurance salesmen. They represented every color, every creed of soldier and American. They set out with their rifles and their rope ladders. It was considered from the start a suicide mission. One intelligence officer remarked, it can't be done. Three old women with brooms could keep these rangers from climbing those cliffs. The cliffs of Point du Hoc, 110 feet straight up. The rangers looked up. They could see the enemy rifles. They could duck the grenades that were thrown at them. They could see the ridge fortified. They were called Rudder's Rangers. Now remember, each of these is somebody's son, somebody's husband, who have volunteered to do this. And they began to climb. They shot ropes, rope ladders over the face of the cliffs. They began to pull themselves up. When one ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, 
a ranger would grab another and begin to climb again. They climbed, they shot back, and they held their footing. They climbed one after another. One of those rangers said the rope was wet and muddy. My hands just couldn't hold. They were like grease. And I came sliding back down. I wrapped my foot around the rope and slowed myself up as much as I could. But my hands burned. And they climbed on those rope ladders, one by one, pulling themselves up. And they began with each gesture to reclaim an entire world. That morning, 225 began to climb within two days, only 90 were left. 70% would not survive that operation. And yet, they kept coming. They took the cliffs. The Germans surrendered. The surviving rangers had a second mission, and that was to secure the ridge. And so they set up a roadblock at the top of the ridge, trying to join Omaha Beach with Utah Beach. That night, the Germans returned, and with a force, overran the rangers. They almost lost the ridge. But in the darkness that night, they desperately waited for the English and the Canadians. Suddenly, they heard the sound of a bagpipe. Bill Millen of the 51st Highlanders who throughout that day on the beach as they ascended from another angle on the ridge the only bagpiper on the day of Normandy they looked up while bullets shot around him he led a group of reinforcements and they kept that hill who are these people why are you and I sitting here today because of someone's son daughter husband they came from all ranks. The Royal Winnipeg Rifles. Poland's 24th Lancers. The Royal Scots Fusiliers. The Screaming Eagles. They fought. Thank God they won. On the night before the assault on Normandy, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Wolverton, with the Screaming Eagles, gathered his men and he said, I'm not a religious man. I don't know your feelings in this manner. But I'm going to ask you to pray with me for the success of the mission before us. And while we pray, let us get on our knees and not look down, but up, with faces raised to the sky, 
so that we can see God and ask his blessing on what we're about to do. And all the men of those screaming eagles bowed their heads in prayer. God Almighty, he prayed, in a few short hours, we will be in battle with the enemy. We do not join battle afraid. We do not ask favors or indulgence, but we ask that, if you will, use us in your, as your instrument for the right and aid in returning peace to the world. We do not know or seek what our fate will be. We ask only this, that if we die, we must. That we die as men would die, without complaining, without pleading, and safe in the feeling that we have done our best for what we believe was right. Lord, protect our loved ones. Be near to us in the fire ahead and fill us now as we pray to you. Two hours later, 29-year-old Robert Wolverton would be shot in a spray of German machine bullets. In all, on those two days of the Normandy invasion, some 425 Allied and German troops were killed, wounded, or went missing during the Battle of Normandy. Is there a link between the freedom that you and I have today of being able to worship freely, to enjoy liberty because of the sacrifice of a soldier on a cliff? The answer is yes. There is a direct link. And as we think about our own day, and we ask where, where do men and women like this come from? They come from homes across the nation. People who believe in freedom of liberty. So often, our churchgoers are so often men and women who are delighted when they join the military to be given a Bible. More importantly, as much as we enjoy our political freedom of worship, we also gather in a church building to remember the life of one man who gave his life that we might have freedom. Freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom of expression, of being able to tell people there is a God. We can know him. You can trust him. He died on a cross. And that is why underscoring and overseeing all truths is John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Let us pray.
Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are willing to go to the battlefield of the cross, that you took the slings and arrows, the bullets, the swords, the bombs of our own guilt and shame, and you took them upon yourself. And so we thank you that we are able to enter into a relationship with you, knowing that we are free, not only politically free because we happen to live in this country, but also that our lives are free of regrets. Our lives are free of guilt and shame because we know where all of our guilt and shame has been placed on the cross of Christ who gave his life for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.